We're supposed to leave at 8 a.m. We gotta play in the morning here. This place is too good. I think maybe I like Farm Boogle Dunes more than the rest of the group, but Lost Farm was on a completely other level. Our enthusiasm was way up because we're playing as a sixum for the first time this trip. Yeah. Golf course opens up a little bit, it's wider. Lost Farm opens up. We got an afternoon round, we got a caddy, and we're just like ready to roll. We're five holes in and ZB is talking about, what time's our flight tomorrow? It's like, it's eight o'clock. It's like, can we play tomorrow morning? We're not even, we're not even through the front nine. At one point, Zach Blair declared the first six holes of Lost Farm was the greatest opening stretch he's ever seen in golf. No, no, greatest stretch of six holes I'd ever played in Not even life. opening stretch. How's that course record hunt going? Depends on the time. This part of the property is called Sal's Point. Uh, that's Richard Sattler's wife. This was gonna be their retirement home. Fourth hole is jammed into this corner of the property that is probably the most photographed and probably one of the most memorable spots uh, on the land. It's one of those shots that it's just like a living photo. I mean, you just wanna sit on that tee box all day. Bill the caddy, he was, a, he was a pro's pro. You know, I'm not gonna say he was the best caddy I've ever had. I think he was a dairy farmer and had better caddies, but I don't think I've ever had a better experience with a caddy than I had with Bill. My favorite part was maybe when he, he wrote down Zach and Todd's name on his hand. We later found out that this was his first time ever caddying for somebody from the back tees. I'm not sure if Bill had picked up on yet that Zach was a professional golfer. Zach asked Bill if there's any birdies coming up. And he goes, oh yeah, mate. There's a there's a par five up here coming up. And I think, I think he'll definitely be able to get there in three. This day was like, the reason you make the trip. You're playing golf in one of the most unbelievable settings in the world and the sun's setting behind this hole as we finish this closing stretch. Like that's probably my favorite memory of the entire trip. We just walked 38 holes. The day after walking 36. How you, how you feeling? I feel awful. <laughs> the sunburn now, you, got, you look like Marv from Home Alone after you get hit by the bricks. My, my whole body hurts. I'm sunburned. Don't ask me if I'm hurt, dog. God, that place was transcendent. Lost Farm spoke to my soul. Let's go drink some beers. Please. Farm Bugle Dunes gets all of the details right when it comes to the hospitality. The lodging, the food, it's all what you need and nothing more. We had a chance to speak with Richard Sattler, who is the owner and developer of Barn Bugle Dunes, and just this awesome guy. He likes to play kind of the aw shucks I'm a potato farmer, I don't really know what I'm doing sort of card, but it's clear talking to him for five minutes, it's it's very obvious that he's a genius at what he does. And Tom Dyke was abandoned of an area in a place called Tasmania, which is an island state of Australia, that could be just as good as this. So Mike Kaiser being a fascinator for great golf course sites, so next thing he rang up to see if he can come and have a look. And then he had a look and like, this is just a special site. You've got to do it. Someone's got to do it that's got a bit of a business now. Don't worry about the golf side of it. We'll give you the advice. Barn Bugle Dunes opened in 2004 and was a pretty immediate success. But with all that land sitting around, it was pretty obvious that the next step was a second golf course. And Richard had people like Mike Kaiser and his whole team in his ear kind of trying to push him and saying, hey, you have the land here to do something really special. We need to do another course. And finally, I think they kind of pushed him over the edge. Could we do the second course? between the two of us. Okay. He'd organise the architects. Yeah. He said the only architects you do is Bill and Ben. The only architects you'd have for the second course would suit them perfectly. And Bill laughed at so said, no, right, we'll do it again. So I mean, like, all right, you win, we'll build another one. <laughs> so I'm probably biased because I'm a huge Core Crenshaw fan, but what they do better than anybody, I think, is create something that feels artistic. I mean, it, it's super subtle. It's It takes five rounds around there to start to notice a lot of the things that they want you to notice. And I think that's so cool. Once they work out exactly what they want, you can't interfere with it. Right. And that's what I say, like dealing with a, an artist or a perfectionist, you can't interfere with them. Yeah. 
and that's the one, probably the one advantage I had that I didn't interfere with anything that the Tom or Bill did. Bill Corr, when he reported back to Richard, he said, hey, there, you got 20 holes out here. Personally, I thought Bill Corr was supposed to be a minimalist. Basically said, we want you to pick uh, the best 18. Why would I want to pick them? Like, you're the best architect, you're the most successful property developer or golf course developer. You want me to pick 18? I haven't got a bloody clue. Easy ways, we'll build 20 and just see what happens. And the fact that he said just build all 20 holes just kind of shows how little ego he has in this whole scenario. No laying up, right? I've just done a study in St Andrews used to be 20 holes. It was only the advancement of golf equipment that brought it back to 18 when they had to actually get a bit more length. So hearing Richard talk about the golf courses was great, uh, but Neil still had a few more questions. What is the difference between a wallaby and a kangaroo? Basically, they're like cousins. End of day two, Dan's still in the lead at six under. I'm in second at minus three, ZB minus two, Neil at plus seven, DJ plus 16, Tron plus 19. Ooh, Tron. You never go full Camilo. I'll tell you what, man, I really like my chances. Cheers, boys. What Cheers. a day. Seriously. All right, boys, it's 5.15 a.m. I don't think we've gotten more than four hours of sleep. Everybody looks like they've been hit by a car, except your boy. Ready to go. I think the rest of us, given our choice, probably would have ultimately slept in that day, but Zach Blair is a complete sicko, and he cannot play enough golf, and it's actually, frankly, very concerning. Those are wallabies, mate. Crikey, look over here. I think I see Rolch right there, my beautiful boy. Dan is absolutely embracing Trandy Moss, boss of the Moss jersey. You got it. When you're leading, it's like wearing the yellow jersey, right? There's some struggling going on this morning. We play a lot of golf. <laughs> Maybe too much golf. I don't think Tron's coming. No, he was sawing logs. He gone. Ejected. We had a couple bottles of Tasmanian Pinot Noir the night prior. I just decided I don't want to jaundice my recollection of this place playing hungover. I'd rather get the extra Z's. <laughs> His glutes are deactivated. His glutes, among with everything else, seems to be deactivated. Very, very sad. <laughs> right, let's go play. Yeah, this sounded like a lot better idea the night before over drinks. But as soon as we stepped outside to the silence of that morning, we knew it was worth it. Back at 5.30. Tour pro David there. One under. Blair's made his first break. There's so many memories about Australia, but when somebody asks about the trip, I think back to that morning at Lost Farm with that light, that silence, and a golf course completely to ourselves on the complete opposite side of the world. Uh, that's an experience I wasn't sure I'd ever have in my life. So spending 24 hours in Tasmania was not enough. Tron and I were kind of saying it'd be good to just go back there for like a week and maybe not even play golf or just disappear into the wilderness for a while. Good to meet you, man. Yeah, really really nice nice Take care. We'll see so, you again. Thanks again. What a day, boys. Thank you for your Thanks again, Brad. Good luck. Great time. Special shout out to Richard. He drove us from the lodge back to the airstrip. Uh, at what other property are you gonna get driven by the owner? Oh. Maybe it was just he was just ensuring that we were actually leaving and getting the hell out of his hair. Nick the stick. Where are we? Hey. Pointing up. Leading us, in, baby. leading us into battle. Higher and higher, Icarus. Not sure if we have enough fuel, but we're gonna give it a shot. Everybody that we had talked to warned us about Metro. It was a damn massacre. The second green's at 15.3, and the third green is at 16. Oh no. No, he did it! <laughs> I'm leaking big time oil. End of day three. Day three, two? We're gonna play a little word association. Tasmania. I can't. I don't know. <laughs> Alright, good game. <laughs> Billy the caddy. Oh. <laughs> Turnover chain. That's my shit. <laughs> uh, Australian accent. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're both very sleepy. Let's cut it there. Oh.